Welcome to PayPod, the show that features thought-provoking interviews with leaders and entrepreneurs in the payments and financial technology industries. From credit card processing to Bitcoin, we cover it all. So if you want to know what's happening right now in the payments industry, stay tuned. Now, here's your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of PayPod. Scott here with you, and I am really looking forward to the episode that we have on tap for you today. We're shifting gears back to more of a consumer focus in the credit card world by taking a look at an important topic, card reviews and ratings. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime I've looked for a new credit card, all the options can be overwhelming. Then you naturally start your search online and you run into all sorts of review sites, some of which might have very different takeaways and opinions regarding the card. So who do you trust? But having good solid reviews and ratings for credit cards and a solid tool to search for and compare cards is a thing that actually exists. Enter cardratings.com, which is a website that focuses on providing this exact thing to folks who are looking to evaluate cards for potentially signing up. In fact, they are one of the original credit card ratings and review websites to hit the market. And as for my guest today, who's going to be helping us explore card ratings and reviews online, I am so happy to be joined by Brooklyn Lowry, who is the Senior Manager and Site Editor for CardRatings.com. Brooklyn, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. To start us off, can you tell us just a little bit about your career? How'd you end up at Card Ratings and what do you do for them? Sure. So I have been a journalist for almost 20 years, and I'm one of the rare people you'll find who started out in a degree path in college, finished it, and then I'm still working in that field almost 20 years later. So I landed out of college in a media relations office. It was a great place to get some experience on both sides of the journalism media relations industry. But then from there, I headed to Boston and took a true journalism job where I worked in covering government and personal finance, feature stories, really anything. It was also a place where I really got interested in credit card rewards for the first time. And that was because it's an expensive place to live. I wanted to travel, wanted to do a lot of things, but didn't have a lot of disposable income. So those credit card rewards allowed me to do some of the things I wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. When I moved to the Midwest a few years later, I still had that interest in credit card rewards. It was very much ingrained in my lifestyle at that point, and Card Ratings was looking for an editor. So today, I get to do something that I am passionate about in my personal life, but I also get to communicate it to consumers, help them find what card is right for them, really understand how credit cards can be tools in their financial wallets, and then help them kind of make good decisions based on their spending and their lifestyles. That's so fantastic. And I love how you sort of united the two things. You know, you had this journalism degree and all this experience there. And then you're like, hey, I'm really into rewards on the side. And then you bring them together. Not many people get to do that in their careers. So hat tip to you for that. (laughs) Thank you. I've, I've enjoyed it. It was a good choice. So now for those who may be unfamiliar, what all does card ratings do? What's your mission? And how do you accomplish it as a business, as a website? So as you already mentioned, Card Ratings was one of the first websites to provide credit card ratings and reviews. It debuted back in 1998. Um, And that was really a time when there was a lot of concern about credit card debt, but there wasn't a lot of discussion about how credit cards could benefit you or even help you tackle that debt. So Card Ratings launched to provide consumers with information. And the goal was then and still is today, 21 years later, to help people understand what credit cards are, how they should best be used in order to maximize their money, and then how to actually choose the card that works best for you. The site has obviously changed in the past 21 years, but the goals still remain the same. And that's just to provide information that most closely helps consumers align credit cards with their given needs, their given spending. I love it. And you know, you said something a little earlier, you mentioned it as credit cards as a tool and rewards as a tool and these kinds of things. And I think it makes so much sense too, when you think about your site where it's like, well, if you're looking for a tool, you might go to Home Depot, you might look at all the different types of saws they have and things like that. So really your guys' site is providing a much needed service for something that is so integral to just commerce and people's financial lives, right? 
Absolutely. We know that there are hundreds of options out there and nobody has time to go through all of those. So our goal is to kind of go through it for you and help you distill it down to the the tool. If you're looking for a hammer, we only want you looking at hammers. We don't want you looking at hammers and screwdrivers. So we want you, if you're looking for cashback cards, that's what we want you to look at and we want you to help you pick one. Absolutely. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about the process for how you guys help someone pick a card that fits them well, that's the Mm -hmm. right card for them, and really a bit about just how it all works. So let's set the stage. What are the most important factors that really differentiate different credit cards from one another? What are the factors that we're even looking at when we're trying to determine which tool, quote unquote, to use? Right. At a very high level, I think credit cards can be broken out into groups based on what level of credit the person applying has. So there are credit cards that are really most likely to be given to people who have excellent or good credit. And then there are also credit cards who are available to people who are maybe just starting to build credit or who are recovering from a bankruptcy, students, things like that. So there's this whole range that you can look in. We can break credit cards down into those categories. We can also talk about are they secured cards versus non-secured or traditional cards. That means do you need to put a deposit down in order to establish a line of credit? Or are they more what people are, tend to be more familiar with when we're talking about a credit card where there's no deposit needed? You have a card and a credit line. Mm-hmm. There's also the difference between credit cards and charge cards. So a charge card, you have to, you're expected to pay off every billing cycle. Whereas a credit card, you can carry a balance from one billing cycle to the next. You'll obviously pay interest on that. So there's some very high level ways to break down credit cards that we kind of want people to start there when they're looking into getting a new card. And once you've kind of figured out that, then you can get into the fun stuff. What kind of rewards are you interested in? Do you need a 0% APR period for one reason or another? That's the fun stuff. But you got to start at the not fun stuff before you get there. Right. You have to get through the, make sure you're in the right category and you're, you're getting something that's going to really work for you. Because if you exactly. start at like, hey, I want these great rewards, but you don't have the credit to support that, then you've missed a step. Sure. And you may even hurt your credit if you apply for a card that there's just not really a good chance of you being approved for. Ah, see, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, as a follow up to this, of these factors, maybe the more fun factors, Mm -hmm. what do you think most consumers tend to zero in on as maybe the biggest determining factor in what card they try to apply for? And why do you think that is? Why do they focus on that factor? Well, unfortunately, I think that sometimes there's a disconnect between what consumers zero in on and what they should zero in on, Mm -hmm. or at least the order in which they do it. So those sign-up bonuses, they're attention-grabbing, they're flashy. That's what people see, and they can blind you to all of the other things you really need to be thinking about. The thing that you have to think about first is your credit score. As I mentioned, if you apply for a card that you're really unlikely to be approved for based on your credit score, you'll just hurt your credit score. Right. That's not moving you in the direction you want to move in. So I do think that people have to start with their credit score and their credit history. And then, and this was actually encouraging to me, last year, Card Ratings did a survey um, of 10 popular travel rewards cards. We asked cardholders of those cards why they applied for those particular cards. And they told us it was the ongoing rewards and not the flashy bonus, which says to me that people are thinking um, and they do recognize that a card has got to fit into your lifestyle long term, not just for the three months that it takes you to earn a sign up bonus. Absolutely. Okay, now that we have all that settled, we sort of have the stage. Can you walk me through how card ratings determines their ratings and reviews? What's the process behind it, you know, when you're evaluating a credit card and what you guys are going to say about it and, and rate it and all that? Sure. First, we are all credit card holders. And I think that's really important. When you talk about some of the big name credit cards, there's probably among the people in our team, somebody has that card. So we're able to talk about it from not just a, oh, well, I read about it on a screen and this is what I think of it. But no, I've actually used this card and know how it works and the value of any given feature. So I think that's important that we all put some skin in the game, if you will, sure, and want to be credit card holders. Objectively, 
we also look at every single card that we rate. We look at its fees, its interest rates, its rewards, its other perks. We look at some of the fine print stuff that maybe the average credit card holder isn't even going to get into when they get that thick book of credit card terms. We take the time to actually read through that and take a look at it and see how that card compares to similar cards. And this goes back to what I said about different cards being available to different credit scores. We are not going to compare a card for excellent credit to a card for, say, a student, because they're just fundamentally different cards. And so we want to make sure that when we're rating a card against another card, we're looking at ones that are truly similar to one another. And we also want to make sure that we're talking about it in a category. We may have a great cash back card that also happens to have a 0% offer, but maybe it's not a great 0% card. It's still a great cash back card, but there are better 0% APR offers out there. Right. So just making sure that you're comparing apples to apples, so to speak. Exactly. Yes. And I like too that you mentioned that your team, you're all card holders and you're using different types of cards and things like that. Because if you think about it, to kind of bring it back to our tool analogy here, if uh, someone was going to recommend a hammer to me and they've never hammered and they aren't using hammers themselves, how are you going to trust that? (laughs) Exactly. That's very true. And credit cards are, they're complex tools. So you do want someone who can speak with some authority and also some personal experience is great. There's a lot of sites out there offering credit card reviews and things like that. And a lot of these sites, they earn revenue when someone signs up for that card Mm -hmm. and things like that. So that leads to the natural question. It's 2019. Everybody's skeptical of everything on the internet, (laughs) rightfully so in a lot of ways. But given how you guys are running a site, you're running a business, how do you ensure objectivity in your ratings so it's not like, oh, you know... Visa's greasing the wheels for this card to be pushed forward or whatever? It's a great question and and it's a fair question to ask. We keep a firm line between our marketing department and our editorial department. And it's really not unlike how a traditional newsroom operates. A traditional newsroom has advertisers and clients through which make money, but their journalists still have to report sometimes on those advertisers or on the interests of those advertisers. The same is true for us. So even if the reporting isn't all that positive, we still have to put it out there. So we take that same approach. And you'll notice when you look at our card reviews, that there's always going to be sort of a downside to any given card mentioned. Mm Mm-hmm. We want to make sure to point that out. There's no perfect card. So we want to talk about where the drawbacks might be. And that really allows a user to make a good decision. One of the other things that I love is that we are able to rely on comments from our readers. So we will occasionally have a reader bring a card to our attention. Very often it's, you know, a credit union card, a small regional card. But if someone brings that to our attention, then we take the time to get out there, find out what that card's all about, check out its features, all the things that we check out for all of sort of the bigger cards that you do see on the site. And if it merits being added to one of our best of lists, we absolutely add it. The reality is that bigger banks often and generally have more resources. So they're able to offer better rewards and terms on their credit cards. Mm -hmm. It also just so happens those bigger banks tend to be our advertisers. It in no way means that we aren't interested in those smaller banks when they can compete. You just describing that, it's it's clear that you're taking editorial directives from your site visitors and from folks who are using your service as opposed to Visa knocking on your door and saying, hey, review this and do this and all that. I think that's really, really huge. Another thing that I noticed when I was just kind of browsing your site and looking around. I love that you guys offer guides on your site to educate consumers on types of credit cards and so on. Why is consumer education so important when it comes to credit cards? So this is one of my favorite parts of my job. I do love the rewards, but I also love knowing that I can actually help somebody kind of make a plan for their financial future or to be on steady footing for their financial future. The rewards are great, but your finances have got to be in order for those rewards to mean anything. So credit cards can make or break you. If you use them correctly, they're an excellent way to build your credit history. You can increase your cash flow. There's, of course, the rewards. It's great, but we all know the horror stories of people who built up hundreds or thousands of dollars in debt. 
So you can't treat a credit card like free money. You have to treat it as an extension of a bank account and it should fit into your existing budget, not allow you to balloon it. So we put those guides out there to really kind of educate people on how to fit it in. Instead of if you are thinking about a credit card, and this is true of sometimes with first credit cards, people just think, oh, this is going to be great. I'll have some extra money. It's never extra money. And that's kind of the key that we want to communicate <laughs> to people. Right. But that all being said, there are great 0% APR periods out there. I myself did a kitchen renovation project a few years ago, saved for it so we could pay cash, but didn't want to deplete the savings account if we didn't have to. So opened a balance transfer card, transferred some debt over to that card and spent the next several months paying it off interest free. It was a 0% balance transfer paid it off interest-free. So we were able to get it fully paid off, keep money in our savings account, and basically had a no interest loan. That's the kind of thing that I know because I work in credit cards, but it's also the kind of thing I want to communicate to consumers that that is such a fantastic option for you if you're responsible. Absolutely. And you can work that into your financial plan and really reap all the benefits that credit cards like that and things like that. And I don't know if that one had any rewards or anything associated with it, but you can get all of the benefits and not harm yourself in the process. Just a few episodes back, I had uh, someone on who is from a nonprofit, and basically they do financial counseling. And so they have people that contact them when they are struggling with credit card debt and things like that. So to make it so you're using them to add to your life and add to your financial toolbox and not get you in a situation where it's a detriment. Absolutely, yes. Now, there are new cards that are coming out, and then there's cards that are ending and cards that are changing and all these kinds of things. It has to be a challenge to make sure everything in your guys' database is up to date. I'm curious, how do you go about maintaining up-to-date reviews and ratings for all of these things? You know, you mentioned that sometimes folks will reach out to you with a card and you'll investigate, but I'm just curious from all the things, the changes that are constantly happening, how do you guys do it? So many years ago, this is well before my time, Card Ratings built its database from what was called the New York State Banking Survey. And this is not something I know a lot about. This is sort of my historical information that's been given to me about the site. But at the time, the survey took a look at all the cards that were offered to residents in New York State, is my understanding, which given the size of New York State, the number of people who live in that state was pretty much every card available in the country. Right, yeah. <laughs> that was our foundational database, and that was years and years ago. So these days, even though that survey is now gone, we had that foundation of that database, and now we update it at least quarterly, which means that someone goes through it card by card and makes sure that all the info is still accurate and up to date. They remove cards that have been discontinued and then researches to find if there has been a card that maybe replaced that discontinued card and add that card into our database as needed. The cards that are, as you mentioned, we do have client cards on the site. Those cards, that information comes to us. So the client will actually just send us updates as, you know, they're intro offers change or what have you. That comes to us. It's really the massive database of our non-client cards on the site that takes an enormous amount of work to keep up to date. You are not wrong about that, but it's such a fantastic resource to have. Especially when there's folks using your site to determine what card they want to go with. So having accurate information is kind of crucial. So it's awesome that you guys, you guys put in the real legwork that makes that run. Absolutely. Now, sometimes people sign up for a credit card and they're unhappy with it. The rewards aren't great enough. They don't like the annual fee, whatever. What do you think the biggest mistake people make when selecting a credit card is? And how can that mistake be avoided? So the biggest mistake someone can make is liking the rewards that a credit card offers and then telling themselves that they'll change their spending habits in order to earn those rewards. For a little while, you might decide, you know, oh, I'm going to cook at home all the time because my credit card offers great grocery store rewards. But ultimately, the card doesn't fit into your lifestyle and you're going to revert back to your original spending and you're going to have a credit card that isn't doing what it could be doing for you. Mm -hmm. 
So there are so many credit card options out there. There's no reason to try and squeeze your spending into a box where it doesn't fit. So take an honest look at your budget, at where you already spend your money, and then start looking for a credit card that aligns with that spending. That's the best way to know you'll earn maximum rewards. And of course, all of this is sort of secondary to that aspect we talked about earlier, where you you have to know your credit history. You have to know if you're applying for a card that works for you and your credit score. But really just pick a card that's going to be something that fits in rather than you have to change to make it fit. I think that makes so much sense. You know, my wife and I right now, we actually just refinanced our mortgage. So we're waiting a bit to get our new credit card here, Mm -hmm. um, aforementioned credit dings and things like that. But when we're looking at credit cards, we're thinking, what, what do we actually spend money on? Like, okay, well, we do travel, but do we travel that much? Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the big things that I'm looking at right now is Amazon Prime has a card and we use the heck out of Amazon Prime. And so it's one of those things where we're looking at our individual spending habits and then trying to find a card that will fit into that and maximize our rewards. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that we're, we're on the right track. <laughs> Absolutely. You're thinking about your credit history and your credit score right now, and then also where your budget is and, and what you spend your money on. That is your absolutely step one and two. Well done. (laughs) Now we've done a few episodes with other industry experts on credit cards and credit card rewards. And one guest I had on basically said that airline cards aren't necessarily worth it because of how they pigeonhole you into using one airline. And airlines can be really tough when it comes to reducing the rewards and things like that. What are your thoughts on that? Can airline cards still be powerful? They can be. Yes. Just like hotel cards. I mean, that's another branded, very specific type of rewards card. So they can be useful, especially now we're starting to see some of these branded cards that don't charge annual fees, which is helpful. You obviously don't want a rewards card that charges an annual fee and you're not going to earn enough rewards to ever offset it. So The key with an airline card is to find that sweet spot where you fly enough to make the card worthwhile and offset that fee in particular if it has one, but you don't fly enough that you've already earned status with that airline. Those cards usually offer you some status of some kind, and so you'd kind of be doubling up where you don't need to. In most cases, people are generally going to be better off with what I would call just a general travel rewards card. So you can use those rewards for any kind of travel, any airline or hotel or a cruise or car rental, any number of, of travel redemption options. Then you aren't pigeonholed. But there are certainly places for an airline-specific card. So I, I don't want to say absolutely not, but you do have to have a pretty specific spending pattern and lifestyle for them to be your best option. Well, you know, I think this goes back to just what we were saying about spending and lifestyle and mm-hmm. how you have to think about that before you sign up for these cards. And, you know, if you're someone who like you're taking Southwest or whatever a bunch, but you're not their super elite member and you're flying multiple times a year and all this kind of stuff... Well, then, okay, maybe that makes sense for you. Right. If you're taking American Airlines sometimes and you're doing this and that, it's like, well, does that really help you? (laughs) If Southwest doesn't have a connection to to the place you're going to most or whatever, that's exactly right. Um, Real quick, just could you tell us just a little bit more about just the general travel rewards cards? They are fundamentally different. What's sort of the the general deal with them and the approach that you might recommend people take when they're they're like, I'm a big travel person and I want this flexibility. What do I look for when I'm looking for a travel rewards card? Most of the best travel rewards cards, not all, are going to charge you an annual fee. So the first thing you would want to make sure is that whatever your travel is, you're going to be able to offset that annual fee. So $95 is a pretty typical annual fee. And with most of these cards, you're going to be able, I mean, that's one hotel room. If you earn enough points for one night in a hotel, then you've probably offset the annual fee. Right. You want to do better than just offsetting it, obviously. You want you want to actually make something from it. So when people start looking at a travel rewards card, we want to make sure if it's, for instance, there are several cards that do allow you to transfer your rewards that you earn on the card into loyalty programs for a given hotel or airline. 
sometimes that can give you even better return on those rewards. So if you are someone who does fly Southwest all the time, you already have Southwest Rapid Rewards accounts, maybe you want to look at a general travel rewards card that would allow you to transfer points into that account mm -hmm. just in case you need them. But also those points are, you can redeem them for statement credits to cover your, your travel expenses. You can redeem them for cash back. The thing about travel rewards cards is that a lot of people think about them as sort of, I have to travel all the time to make this worthwhile. Well, not necessarily. Maybe you're saving up for like your 10 year anniversary trip or something. Well, you can just keep piling points into that, a travel rewards card should still fit into your life. It should still reward you for the things you do on a regular basis, not just when you buy a hotel room for the night or something like that. So we want to look for a travel rewards card that really fits into your everyday life, but then can maybe help you work toward a travel goal. And those general cards are, are kind of the best designed for that in most cases. Do you in general recommend when people are thinking about rewards cards that people have sort of a goal in mind, whatever it might be, what they want out of their rewards and what they might be trying to achieve before selecting one? I think if you have a very specific goal, like, like I mentioned that, that anniversary trip, I think that's fine. But really, I would just say more have a lifestyle goal in mind. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be, maybe you can't travel all the time, but if you really would like to be someone who takes at least one big trip once a year, that's probably enough for you to think, all right, there's got to be a travel rewards card out there that could work for me. If you have more than one card, in my family, we have travel rewards cards and cashback cards, and they we kind of have different goals for those cards. So um, the cashback card, the rewards we earn from that just goes into sort of a rainy day fund, just as our, oh, well, if we're bored today. We want to do something else. What's in our rainy day fund that won't affect our budget? And we could just grab those rewards out for today and go do something. So I think having a general goal in mind is nice. If you get too specific, then all of a sudden that card kind of becomes a weight once you've passed that goal. Then you have to think, okay, now what? So just a lifestyle goal in mind and general idea is probably fine. I think that's great advice. And I'll just share a quick story. When I got my first credit card in college, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I had thank you rewards points. And I was like, I want a digital camera because, of course, I didn't predict that we'd have digital cameras in our phones <laughs> at the time. But I was like, I want this digital camera. So I just worked towards it and I was spending it. Da, 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 da. I got the digital camera. Then it was like, OK, now what? I, now what? Now I have this digital camera. And I think you're exactly right. And then now, you know, I sort of operate on sort of a lifestyle thing. Like I use a lot of my rewards points for I like to play video games. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I like to not actually spend money on buying new video games. <laughs> it's a weird thing. But, I don't know. but what I do is I look and I'm like, that $60 game was free because I just use points for it. And that's how it fits into my lifestyle. So basically just underscoring your point. I think that's fantastic advice. I think you're doing great. Yes. <laughs> this is very affirming. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> okay. Let's turn our thoughts to the future here peer into the crystal ball. What do you see in the future for cardratings.com? Are there any specific products or articles or things like that on the horizon that you can share that our listeners might find to be really interesting? You know, the credit card landscape changes all the time. I don't know that I have any specific tool that I'm ready to talk about, but I can say there are a couple things that we're carefully watching in the credit card industry right now. And as the time comes, we'll obviously be writing about them and talking about them. But the one thing that is really interesting to me right now is that there seem to be more and more lifestyle-based cards that are coming into the picture. So there had been a lot of sort of these sign-up bonus battles where cards were trying to outdo one another and win over users. But I think we're starting to see more educated card holders who are realizing that that bonus isn't the be-all and end-all, and they're wondering how the card is going to fit in long-term. So we're seeing more cards come out that focus on specific lifestyles. What I mean by that is like dining or Uber or 
Apple, the Apple card is coming out soon. Yeah. You mentioned the Prime cards earlier. So sort of this very specific niche cards that appeal to a specific customer base. I think that's going to be really interesting to see kind of how far the industry takes that, how specific they get with that. Yeah, I'm interested to see that as well. And it really kind of does underscore a lot of what we've been talking about today is the importance of how the card fits into your lifestyle. So it makes sense that the card issuers and companies would be leaning into that and saying, well, okay, if this is what people are starting to you know, adjust their expectations for, let's give it to them, right? Yeah, that's true. And I'm honestly surprised it's taken as long as it has. But I think we're kind of just seeing the tip of the iceberg now. Okay, we have a segment that we like to do on every show. We like to end with it. It's five questions, rapid fire. Brooklyn, are you ready? I hope so. (laughs) Now, we were just talking about, you know, what you see a little bit in the future for uh, cards, but can you make a prediction about the future of payments that you expect will happen in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah. So I actually think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Facebook's Libra cryptocurrency. Since Facebook is publicly traded, I think we're going to have a fair amount of insight into how this whole experiment goes. And I think if it's successful, we might see some other companies starting to dabble in the cryptocurrency world. But we'll see. We're all watching that. Very interested. And just from a regulatory standpoint and things like that, it's going to be some interesting outcomes from this. So good one. (laughs) What's one cool piece of payment related technology that you've come across recently that's unrelated directly to your company that impressed you? This is not specifically related to payments, and I wouldn't even say it's new technology, but I'm in the midst of planning a Disney vacation right now. So it's very top of mind for me. Ooh, love it. I have been just so impressed with the magic band technology Mm -hmm. that Disney gives to its guests. It's essentially disposable, but the band on your wrist holds everything from a hotel key to a theme park ticket, credit card numbers, meal plans, ride passes, and you don't really even have to interact with it. The technology is such that when you scan your band, it knows what element that's, that's on that band is needed in that moment. I find it fascinating how far we have come in such a short amount of time when it comes to wearables and to technology. I just think it's really interesting. Absolutely. And what I would add to that is is even from just a pure payments perspective, we're here in the US, around the world and like China and places like that, there's people walking around without, they don't even have their wallets on them and they're just paying everything and going through their lives. It feels to me like so much of this technology, like what you're mentioning at Disney and everything like that, is just going to kind of keep keep. Uh, coming together. And uh, essentially, we're going to reach a point where you can just do whatever you need to do with some kind of wearable or what have you. It's going to be really interesting to see. For better or worse. (laughs) Yeah, right. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of pursuant to this, in the next five years, most Americans will make a purchase with either Bitcoin, Apple Pay, some other thing. Which one and why? I think Apple in particular is hoping it's going to be Apple Pay, given their card that they're coming out with here soon. But I'm not sure that it is. I think you need something a bit more ubiquitous and you have enough people in the Android camp or just anti-Apple people that I'm not sure Apple Pay is ever going to win them over. So I actually think Facebook is the right scope of company to win this battle in terms of market share. But as you mentioned a little bit ago, from a regulatory perspective, that could get really interesting. And, you know, it's their market share that is also causing the regulatory issues. So I really just don't know yet, but I don't think we've seen it. I think it's going to have to be something that's not quite out there yet. What's one piece of advice you would have for someone who's considering like the payments or or payment technology industry as a career? Oh boy, Um, keep learning and keep up. I know it sounds really cliche, but it's especially true in the technology industry. Things are changing so quickly that you have to be willing to just always, always be reading and watching And also using the new forms of technology and payments that are available. You can't just sort of read about them and expect to really understand them. So keep looking at it. Keep your eyes open and pay attention and then jump in there. Be among the first to jump in and see how it actually works. Last question. 
What's the best business advice you've ever received and from whom? So I had an editor when I was an intern who told me that every good journalist needs a certain amount of ego. And I know that isn't elegant (laughs) at all to say, but it has always stuck with me. And the longer I've been a professional, the, the more I think that advice kind of extends beyond journalism because everyone is going to have a bad day. Everyone is going to mess something up from time to time. Things are going to go badly. But you have to be able to recover from that mistake. You have to own it and then fix it and then not let it define who you are as a professional. So I guess you could call that confidence in your own abilities. But I think that extra little sort of the jolt of ego comes into play is that thing that conquers your worst days of self-doubt. So I thank him for that little tidbit, as inelegant as it was. I think that's fantastic advice. And I think we can all relate. We've all had those rough days. And that ability to be like, okay, shake it off. I got this. Let's move forward. I I agree with that. Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. Brooklyn, I wanted to thank you so, so much for joining me on the show today. Just a, a fantastic exploration of everything you guys are doing and credit cards in general. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed my time. I want to give you the last word. If folks are listening to this and they want to find out more, where do they go? Where do they connect with you guys? Sure. Well, we are at cardratings.com. The homepage there should just help you kind of get into whatever you need to get into, whether you want to look at just reviews of cards or you want to actually compare some things side by side. Or as we've talked about, if you're looking for specifics on how cards actually work, what the rewards kind of do, how to do it well, we have a whole section of guides and tools there as well. Awesome. Thanks again, Brooklyn. Thank you. So that completes our show today. Thanks so much for listening. And don't forget to subscribe if you like the show. You can do so on iTunes, Google Play, and many other platforms. So until next time, I'll see you then. And thanks again for listening. Thank you for listening to another episode of PayPod, brought to you by Soar Payments. Soar Payments is a leading merchant services provider for e-commerce, high risk, and hard to place businesses. If you'd like to get the latest PayPod episode sent to you automatically, subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher, or visit soarpay.com slash podcast. Thank you.